Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. In part two, we find out what happened after all. Enjoy the show. It seemed like such a waste. She was trapped in this house full of tainted memories, wondering what she had done wrong. She was too depressed to move on with her life or even try to find a job. Maybe that's why I was so angry with my mother. I didn't want my father to go through this. If their marriage was going to end, I needed to make sure he got back on his feet. My attempt to set him up with Miss Aubrey failed. My father didn't even notice how hot she was. Hell, he could barely ask her to look at the engine of her damn car. And Miss Aubrey was no help either. I could tell she was interested in my father, but she too was too shy to take any action against him. This just highlighted one of the problems I had with the Bible. If the meek inherit the earth, they would not know what to do with it, and someone else would take it away from them. I needed to find someone who would be more aggressive toward my father. My mother didn't realize it, but nothing we talked about really mattered. I just pulled her along with me until I was ready to throw her overboard. Did I feel guilty for lying to her? Of course not. She didn't feel guilty or even think there was anything wrong with what she did until she got caught. Then I realized that I already knew who the ideal person for my dad was. Danielle's mom would be perfect for him. She wasn't as sweet as Miss Abra, but who is? Mrs. Kenny was still slimmer and better built than my mother, and she looked pretty too, or she would be if I could get her to put on makeup and cover up the bags under her eyes. She could help her dad get over her mom, and her dad could help her get over the divorce and feel like a woman again. I don't know why I didn't think of this first. Monday was a hectic day at school. Mr. Eddington avoided me. I tried going to his office and telling him I saw him in the park on Saturday, but it seemed like every time I saw him, he was gone. Although I saw him go to lunch with his new secretary during lunch, I met Miss Abra. I think she was looking for me. Hi, Melinda, she said. So, what service did you need from me? I just wanted you to help me pick out an outfit for the Harvest Festival dance, I said. I would be glad, she smiled. But I told you that I knew exactly where she was going, Miss Abra. You are beautiful, I said. You are probably the prettiest woman I have ever seen. Guys instantly go crazy for you. Before I could finish my thought, she said something under her breath that stopped me in my tracks. I'd rather have your help then, please forgive me for this, because I'm sure she's your friend, but some fat art teacher who thinks she's America's next top model, I said. We looked at each other strangely. I'm really sorry, she said. I didn't want to say it out loud. I didn't mean for it to sound that way. I didn't mean to say what I said about your friend, I said. We need to talk, I said. Can you take me home after school? You can come over to my house and see what outfit I choose, and then maybe we can have a snack and talk about what you said. I promise that what we talk about won't go any further than just the two of us. She looked nervous but nodded her head and left. I was so excited when I told her how attractive she was. She whispered, it's a shame your father doesn't think so. After this conversation, I was so excited that I could not sit still until the end of class. I noticed that my concentration was slipping and I kept looking at my watch. Finally, 3.30 came. I packed my books and practically ran to Miss Abra's laboratory. As usual, there was a group of students waiting to talk to her about something, most of them guys who just wanted to look at her. I noticed that after Saturday's walk, she had a much larger following among the freshmen and sophomores, so we were able to do more than just collect samples. This got me thinking about a few things. First of all, I didn't think I would want to be so beautiful, this will probably be a pain in the fifth place. All sorts of guys you're not interested in are constantly hanging around, trying to get you to pay attention to them. It got me thinking about Saturday and the coldness she showed towards Coach. I think this helped me understand her better. She was very polite to most of the male volunteers but also wary. She kept a neutral expression and avoided smiling too much. But with the coach, she seemed to use every opportunity to push him away. Then I remembered that the coach took every opportunity to act as if there was some kind of relationship between them. He called her baby and then he tried to call her by name. She pointedly rejected both of these attempts. Then I realized that things were probably worse for her than I could have imagined. But on the other hand, I clearly missed her interest in my father. She told him her name, and when we were ready to leave, she called him back. 
She also allowed him to ask her a personal question, although my father's idea of what is personal is stupid. She then stood next to him as close as possible without even touching him as he looked at the engine of her car. I also remembered the smile on her face as they stood there. This, of course, caused the coach to come in and make a fool of himself again. Remembering this sequence of events made me seriously think about trying to get her to do something with my father. I have to admit that my father, although not a weakling, is not very aggressive either. With all the Toms, Dicks, and Harrys in the area looking at her with admiration at first sight, what does the relationship between them mean to my father? Melinda, are you okay? asked Miss Abra. I looked up and realized that we were alone in the room. I was so deep in my thoughts that I didn't even realize that she had gotten rid of all her students and was waiting for me. Sorry, ma'am, I said. I was just thinking. You do that a lot, don't you? She smiled. That's probably why you're such a good student. We got into her car, and as we pulled out of the parking lot, she started the engine, and the car took off, leaving a spray of gravel behind us. Not bad, I said. She looked at me. Your car has power, but it's also smooth. My father couldn't have done it if everyone in the area hadn't ducked out of the way. I could probably drive this car, I said. You don't drive your dad's car? She asked while I was talking about this. I was analyzing her voice and everything she did, her hands gripped the steering wheel tighter, and there was much more tension in her leg. There was also the fact that I was talking about cars in general, she was the one who raised my father's Mustang. Well, he let me drive her, I said. I'm the only person he's ever allowed to do this, but this car scares the life out of me, pardon the expression, but it's true. My dad treats this car like his second child, but this is a cruel thing. If you don't turn on the traction control, forget about it, it burns rubber every time it starts. His previous Mustang had a manual transmission, the clutch was so tight that it was difficult for me to change gears. This car is automatic, my dad must have the reflexes of a racing driver because this car goes 35 miles per hour without even stepping on the gas. I don't know how my dad manages it on residential streets and on the highway, every time you look at the speedometer, it's scary. I've only driven for a little over a year, so I don't like driving fast. I took her on the highway once, and I probably thought I was going about 60. Our family car shakes a little when you drive faster than 65. I noticed that I was overtaking cars as if they were standing still, and I looked at the speedometer, realizing that I was going 90, and the car was solid as a rock, she was actually purring, this horse loves to run. By the time we got to the house, she pulled into the driveway behind my mom's car. I left, and we went up to my room. I took out my chosen outfits, and she looked at them all before saying anything. They are all good, she began, but I think what will really make the difference is the person in them. Melinda, you can look good in any of these outfits and will probably be one of the best-dressed women at the dance. I would rule out these two unless you have something that can be used as a stole, even when it is warm during the day, at night the dance becomes quite chilly. The sound of our voices must have carried because my mother looked into the room and then entered. Hello, she said. I didn't know you were already home, Melinda, or that you have a guest. Mrs. Abra, good to see you. Hello, Teresa, Mrs. Abra said. Call me Elena. I just realized I haven't seen you for about a week, you're on vacation? No, my mother said, looking at me. I quit. Can I offer you something to eat or drink? No, thank you, Teresa, we're going to go out and get something to eat, Mrs. Abra said. I didn't hear that you were resigning, we usually have a party when someone leaves. The decision had to be very sudden, my mom said. I don't think anyone knows about this yet, but on the other hand, I'm not sure I could have worked with Russell as much as you have, this man makes my skin crawl, he's worse than Coach Cleats. Every time I stand in front of him, I think he's trying to imagine what I would look like without clothes. Women, you must have stones in your head or you must be a real, to be with someone like him. My mom looked nervous. Well, have fun, she said and went back to her business. I tried on both outfits, and we agreed that the blue dress fit better. After that, I changed back into my clothes, and we headed to Wendy's. As we sat down for hamburgers, she asked her first question. Melinda, if your mom is home, why didn't you just ask her to help you pick out outfits, she asked. We'll come back to this, I said. 
can we talk about the important things first? Fine, she smiled, looking at me with amusement on her face. Melinda, you will be a great prosecutor. You have the ability to see the essence of things. I nodded. I'm really not trying to be cruel or hurtful, ma'am, but this is important to me, so forgive me if I step on your feet, okay? I said. She was still looking at me with a smile. You like my dad, don't you? I asked suddenly. She choked on her french fries. She took a long sip of her soda and then looked at me with wide eyes. Of course not, she muttered. I'm not a destroyer of families. Your dad is a married man. I just looked at her. She nervously picked at her fries. No one will ever know what we talked about here, I said, still looking at her. Melinda, I'm 33 years old, she began. I've only been in love once, it ended tragically, and I've been on the sidelines ever since. It wasn't that I didn't want to move on, I just didn't. A few years ago, I returned to my hometown and looked at my in-laws. I guess I got lonely, and I thought maybe an apple from the same tree would work where nothing else had worked. He had three brothers, the eldest was a drunkard who beat his wife, the youngest who was five years younger than me, was a pill addict, and the middle one who served in the army with my husband is in prison for some time. I wondered what my life would be like when he returned from the army. Would he have become just like his brothers, or was he a special person? I guess I'll never know. My sister-in-law tells me that Robert, that's the older brother, was an angel for the first five years of their marriage. As he got older, she said he changed and became more like their father, she never expected him to hit her the first time. She told me to hold on to my good memories, but I got the impression that she thought he would have changed too. I wanted to move on, but I react to most men the same way you react to a tree. I'm not stupid, Melinda, I know I'm attractive, but so are you. Can't you tell by the look of a guy if you really like him or if he just wants to have a night with you? I nodded, and she was right. I've spent my whole life trying to overcome my appearance, she said. I had to work twice as hard as everyone else to prove that I was interested in science in college. No one wanted me in their group for group assignments because everyone thought I was stupid. The only guy who watched it, I married him, Melinda. He was funny and shy, and he danced to different music. Do you know what he told me the first time? I shook my head. I was in the library with a book in my hands. He came up and sat down next to me. He began to write a term paper. His work was supposed to be printed, but he wrote it by hand. I found out later that he always did things the way he wanted, no matter what. He was a terrible typist, but he had great handwriting. Eventually, we started spending a lot of time exchanging glances. Finally, he just looked at me and said, God, you're so ugly. She said with the biggest smile on his face. Shall we have lunch together? If I'm so ugly, why do you want to show off with me? I asked. My father told me never to fall in love with a beautiful woman, he said, and since I want to marry you more than anything in life, you must be ugly so that I don't break my promise to my father. He constantly surprised me, she said. All the time until the end, and no one had such an influence on me since he died, until I met your father. He's such a contradictory person, he's very handsome, but instead of being arrogant, he's humble. He's clearly confident in himself, but unlike the other dads who were there on Saturday, he didn't stand with other guys discussing golf. He spent the entire day running through the woods with his daughter, you could see the joy on his face when you found different leaves or insects. It seemed like every damn guy was coming up to me like I had to fall on my face and bow to them because they came up and said some cliché thing. I guess I must feel desperate because I'm a widow, she sighed and began munching on her fries again. Melinda, I think I'm desperate, my biological clock is ticking like hell, but I intend to get married once again in my life. When I find a partner, it will be for the rest of my life, so it has to be the right person. And since you said that this will stay between us and I trust you, yes, I really like your dad but you have nothing to worry about. I'm not the type of woman who goes after married men. Besides, he's more interested in my car than me. The whole time we were talking, I was afraid to breathe. I had never felt this way before. I wanted his touch so much, but I didn't dare. She looked a little sad as she ate some more of her hamburger, but as sad as she looked, she seemed more relaxed. It was as if being able to tell someone about it had lifted a lot of tension off her shoulders. I'll help you. I said as she hung her head and munched on a hamburger. 
She stopped chewing and choked again. I had to stop talking while she was eating before I killed her. Melinda, he's married, and your mother? He's cheating on him, I spat loudly. My mother was entertaining Russell Eddington in my father's bed when I caught them. She doesn't deserve him, I won't let her hurt anyone. They are getting divorced, that's why she had to quit her damn job. I can't stand her, that's why I don't ask for advice on anything, and my father will be heartbroken when he finds out. The best way for me to do this is to find someone who is better for him, someone who can help him get through the pain he'll feel when he finds out, and then help him move on. You are perfect for this role, ma'am, and the reason he hasn't noticed you is because he really thinks he's being faithful to a woman who deserves him. No matter how beautiful you are, my father is simply not a cheater, we just need to get you two together a few times. I returned home feeling better than I have since this all started. I wanted to pull out a cigar and say, I like it when a plan comes to fruition. I guess that's why I was surprised when the wheels of my brilliant plan started to fall off. Melinda, what the hell are you playing at? My mother asked angrily. You're right, I saw you in the park on Saturday. I was afraid that you would tell your father. I saw you introduce him to math and science Barbie. Then you actually brought that into my house. If you need help choosing your clothes, that's my job. I am your mother. Did you know she prefers girls? She asked. I started laughing out loud. She doesn't prefer girls, I laughed. You probably heard it from Eddington, didn't you? No, she's not like that. She's just picky about her men. What do you mean? She asked curiously. I knew I had it, this wasn't what I planned, but it will probably work. Do you remember our conversation about how you reconcile with dad? I asked. She nodded excitedly. The only way to even things out is for daddy to have a night with someone else too, then everything will be smooth, and we can become a family again. I'm tired of all this anger, mom. I miss you. So, if your father has an intim with her a few times, it will all be over, and you'll never tell him? She asked. And you will forgive me too, that was the plan, I said, but it won't work. Dad didn't even look at her twice, he was more interested in her car. I'll help you, she said. No one knows your father better than I do. We just need to bring them together in enough situations where they actually have to touch each other. Then, when we're ready to lower the boom, we need to get your father drunk. Let me think for a moment while I prepare dinner, we can do it. She smiled widely and held out her hand for me to give her a high five. God, she's so stupid, I thought as she left the room. The next day at school, I told Mrs. Abra, or Helena as I called her since we were partners in crime, about the new developments. I also told her about my mom's first idea, which was to get the two of them together. We had to have a party that was also a practice dance for the harvest dance. This was mainly done so that younger schoolchildren could learn to dance before the big festival. Most of the children were excellent at dance club style dances but had little experience in partner dances like those performed at a harvest festival. I convinced Helena to sign up as a chaperone and told her that I would work to get my father to do it too. Once there, I got them to dance with each other, and we were all one step closer to getting the two of them together. The funny thing is that this idea came to my mother. As the evening of the practice dance approached, I noticed that my mother was becoming more and more worried. I still didn't talk to her much, but I talked to her about the plan, she had some interesting ideas about what to do after the practice dance. Either way, there was magic in the air on the night of the practice dance. I let my mom put a flower in my hair while I waited for Dean to pick me up. Both dad and I were shocked that mom wasn't coming. I actually got angry and pulled her aside. I actually thought it would be cool to invite her over here and make her watch daddy dance with Helena. I wanted to enjoy the way she squirmed, watching as a woman who was younger than her, better built than her, and more beautiful than her did everything she could to excite my father right in front of her eyes. Both Helena and I agreed that my mother simply did not love my father despite all her statements. She refused. The first blow was her infidelity. If she loved him, she wouldn't cheat on him. The second blow was her refusal to confess everything when she was caught. The final blow was the fact that not only was she willing to let him have a night with another woman, she was willing to help with planning and executing the event. She had nothing to do with my father if she loved him as much as she claimed. She should have cried at the thought of him having an intimate with someone else. 
I looked at her in the kitchen, my dad upstairs, and Dean waiting in the living room. Why don't you go? I asked. Go upstairs and get dressed now. Melinda, you don't want me there, she said. Think about it, honey. You have an analytical mind, you know how shy your father is. There's no way you'll dance with Helena if I'm there. He will consider this an insult to me, and secondly, you'll have to convince him that Helena is lonely and upset because no one will dance with her anymore. Besides that, he won't approach her, no matter how beautiful she is. I had to admit that she was right. I didn't even think about how to persuade him to dance with her. What I didn't realize was that my mother had outsmarted me. Damn, I was only 18, I couldn't keep track of all the factors, and she was mean. When Dean and I were driving to the dance, he tried to start a conversation, although my thoughts were busy with other things. There were so many things that could go wrong. I reached out and took Dean's hand. He's so lucky, his calm nature reminded me of my father. This was one of the reasons why I loved him so much. Dean had the same capacity for commitment to a cause, idea, or person that my father had. But unlike my father, Dean would never have to worry about the woman he loved cheating on him. Other than the fact that the parking lot filled up after dark, the school remained unchanged. We stopped at Dean's house so his dad could take a photo of us while his mom chewed gum. Okay, I'll take that back, it was insulting to imply that his mother was a cow. In fact, I want to apologize to the cows who were offended by my heartless comparison. As we approached the door, I heard the powerful roar of an engine and smiled. Wow, that must be your dad's Mustang, Dean said. I laughed and shook my head. No, honey, that's not my father, I said. A few seconds later, we heard an even lower and louder hum as he started the engine and pulled into the parking lot. These two cars pulled together and actually parked next to Dean's Toyota. I'm sure most people thought it was a coincidence that my dad's GTO and Mustang GT pulled up at the same time and next to each other. But to me, it was more of an omen. I saw this as a sign from the authorities that they not only sanctioned but also blessed this union. I watched as Miss Abra looked across the car at my father. My father fiddled with his keys. Out of nowhere, Coach Kitts ran up to Helena's car and tried to open the door for her. Since the door was locked, he tried again and again. She rolled down the window and asked what he was doing. I'm just opening your door, baby, he smiled. I'm trying to be a damn gentleman here. I figured since we're going to spend most of the evening rubbing bellies, and if we're lucky, most of the night after that, we might as well start off on a good note. We don't start on any note, she said coldly. We don't even start the same song. Your comment about belly rubs is inappropriate in the workplace. I could easily file an intimate harassment case against you if… Hello, Helena, my father said. I hate to bother you, but I was hoping you could show me where the gym is. Are you the football coach? He asked Coach Kitts. He extended his hand to shake. I heard the team is looking good. People are saying you guys might even win a game this year. The locks on Helena's car opened, and she got out of the car. It was as if every head in the parking lot turned at the same time. Helena wore a white sheath dress that hugged her curves. She had a string of pearls around her neck and in her hair, like mine. She had a large flower tucked into one side. She looked my dad in the eyes and said, Hi, Jim. I'd like to show you around. In fact, they like it when escorts work in teams. One of us will cope with the girl and the other with the boy. Just let me grab my purse. She sat back in the car and grabbed an expensive-looking white leather clutch. She took my father's arm and they entered the building together. I grabbed Dean's hand and pulled him along. I needed to see what happened next. I noticed that a lot of people were looking at them. Both when they entered, Helena might as well have painted a target on herself. Most of the women there immediately hated her. She set new paradigms as soon as she entered the building. Its effect was especially pronounced among women. Both she and my father looked like they belonged together. I was proud of the way my father stepped in to help her with the trainer, who was still angrily trailing behind them. Okay, we're here, and you're safe. My father smiled. I had a bad feeling when he turned to leave. Jim, she said quietly, where are you going? Um, I just wanted to get you away from the guy who was hitting on you, he said. I'm going to go check on Keith. 
She took his hand again. You saved me, so now you're stuck with me. Also, you did a great job with Melinda. It's time to give her some space. She's a smart, independent woman. I think we're the ones who need a little TLC. My father looked embarrassed but sat down at the table with her. Then what I thought was another disruption to my plan happened. We all heard the sound of a car engine running coming from my father's jacket. He smiled and took out his iPhone. Helena looked across from me, and I shrugged. Oh, hi, honey, he said. Are you feeling better? Then he laughed, listened, and fell silent. I was sure that he would run to her house and make a checkmate this beat me up, but at least I got him to pay attention to Helena. He motioned for me to come to him. I have problems, he said. Your mom says Helena is depressed because only idiots ask Helena out. I saw this coach, honey, and your mom says I should dance with her. How the hell am I supposed to do this? You can do it, dad, I said. Just be yourself. After all, you're only asking her to dance, not to marry you. For some reason, the DJ wasn't fully tuned in yet, but he played the song, and a lot of people headed to the dance floor. Dean and I went dancing, and as he spun me around the floor, I couldn't help but keep an eye on our table. As Dean and I returned to the table, a man came up and asked Helena if she wanted to dance. I'd love to, she said cheerfully, but I already promised someone all my dances, although he hasn't asked me yet. He must be an idiot, the man said, before Elena could say anything. The DJ played another song, we heard a howling female voice with a beautiful Irish accent. The light of day is slowly fading, time stands still with you. I'm only waiting for you, a light touch, and I feel weak. Come on, Jim, they're playing our song, Elena said. Do we have a song? Asked my father when they hit the dance floor. I listened to the song. When the singer reached the chorus, I couldn't help but smile a little. Elena knew exactly what she was doing. They danced, and although my father seemed confused at first, a smile appeared on his face. I realized that everything would be okay. Looking at Elena, I knew that he was in good hands. She began to dance with him very formally, but very slowly, purposefully pulling him closer. When they weren't dancing together, they sat at the table and laughed and talked. Elena was in seventh heaven, she was literally beaming. Men from all sides tried to catch her gaze, but she kept both eyes strictly on my father. She caught my gaze and silently whispered, breathless. Even though my poor dad didn't realize it, he was having an almost perfect first date. We had only been there for about three hours when the fantasy ended. Someone must have spiked the punch because Coach Cleats was angry and drunk. He headed towards our table, and Elena spoke and leaned towards my father. The huge figure of Coach Cleats loomed over them. He stood there glaring as they laughed. Elena, get up and dance with me, he demanded. This guy has been monopolizing you all damn night. You're wrong, Mr. Cleats, she said. I monopolized him. Can you imagine how many women wanted to dance with him, and he rejected them all? As anger flashed across the coach's face, my father stood up and positioned himself between Elena and the coach. Listen, buddy, the coach sneered. I know it's hard, and I feel sorry for you, but just because Eddington is having fun with your wife, that doesn't mean you can interfere in my affairs with my woman. And with that, my father's fist slammed into the coach's face so quickly that he didn't even see it coming. The blow was so powerful that it lifted the coach into the air and knocked him down. A mixture of confusion, anger, and pain competed for space on my father's face. He looked around in complete bewilderment. I didn't know what to say or do. This was never included in my plans. I never imagined that anyone other than me would ever tell my father what was going on. Unexpectedly, however, a jealous, drunken idiot ruined everything. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, the bottom fell out. Three police officers pushed through the crowd and headed towards my father. He put his hands out to be cuffed, but they just looked at him. Sir, are you James Carson? asked the first officer. My father nodded his head. Sir, we need you to come with us, please, the officer said. Do I have to wait until we get to the station to call my lawyer? asked my father. The police looked at him like he was crazy. Sir, no one cares that you hit that drunk, the officer said. This is a private party. 
security is responsible for maintaining order on the property. If we're not called, we don't care. We came for you because your wife was in an accident. She fell, asked my father. She was in a car accident, the officer said. She wasn't driving. The man with her also has very serious injuries. We'll follow you, Jim, Elena said. I was glad she took the lead because I was still in shock and felt so bad for my dad. Everything I planned, all my schemes, were designed and intended to ensure that he experienced as little pain as possible. It all blew up in my face. Dean and Elena walked me out of the school. Everyone was staring at us. Elena threw me her keys and told me to follow her. She got into my father's car and followed the police. The tire squealed very loudly, but she soon pulled herself together. I followed her as she asked, and Dean followed me. I was most interested in how the hell my mom ended up in the accident. After all, she should have stayed at home. We went into the waiting room near the reception department. We were directed to a waiting room on the third floor next to the operating rooms. This bothered me, and as analytical as my mind is, it got me thinking. Here I sit, waiting for my mom to come out of surgery, and my only thoughts are about my dad and how this will affect my plans for him. Dean was very supportive as usual, but what surprised me most was Elena. I thought she would be a neutral observer or at best a concerned friend, but she was clearly upset, and we didn't even know what had happened yet. I hugged her and told her everything would be fine. As we sat down, a woman came into the room with two small children. The woman greeted Elena and sat down on the other side of the room. Elena barely returned her greeting. She didn't take her eyes off the door. Sitting there, I considered all the possible variations of events and assessed how their possible outcomes might affect what I needed to do. The nightmare scenario for me was if somehow this accident would bring my parents closer together. I could imagine them having tearful conversations at her bedside and him agreeing to forgive her if she would just get better. She would then tell him that I knew about their relationship all along. It could ruin my relationship with the person I love the most. All this, despite my careful plans, turned into the worst nightmare imaginable. The door to the operating rooms and the corridor between them swung open. The doctor came out followed by my father. Before I even realized the door had opened, Elena had already gotten up and walked towards her dad. She hugged him, and he put his arm around her waist as he continued to talk to the doctor. The thing that caught my eye the most was his face. My father tried to hold on, but he was clearly very angry. I moved closer to them to hear what they were saying. As I got closer, I heard parts of the conversation. I heard the doctor say, Ah, the head hit the center console under the airbag. I also heard, Ah, will likely require reconstructive surgery if she survives. Another thing I only caught part of was, can't figure out why her head was there. Then I heard, the jaw closed and took a bite. This last remark completed the picture for me. I must be a monster because I turned around and ran out of the waiting room. I found the nearest restroom on the floor and made sure it was empty. Then, I just burst out laughing. It took me about five minutes of hysterical laughter before I could put on a serious face. When I returned to the waiting room, I heard a slight argument. I'm telling you right now, if you do this your way, you will live your life with a lot of regrets, my father stood, and Elena held his hand and told him to sit back down. But I don't care, he said. She's covered under my health plan. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to talk to her. I just want her out of my life. She pulled him back into the chair next to her, and he didn't resist. Honey, I know you don't want to talk to her, and that's why I want you to do it. If you really want her out of your life, well, it just won't work, she said. He turned and looked at her, and she hugged him. If you leave this hospital and plan to never see or talk to her again, it still won't work. Maybe you can find a way to let the lawyers handle everything so you never have to talk to her either. You get the house, or she gets it, and you never see each other again, he nodded his head. This won't work, Jim, she continued. I noticed that my father calmed down as she spoke. I also noticed that the woman on the other side of the room was listening to everything she said. This is the real world, and when two people have been together for a long time, they create bonds. The most important of these connections is that you have a beautiful daughter, and there are many more events in her life where you will probably at least run into each other. 
Are you telling me that you won't go to Melinda's wedding because her mother will be there? Or do you want to tell me that you are such a cruel person that you would deny the woman who gave birth to her the privilege of seeing her only daughter marry? My father pursed his lips and crossed his arms over his chest. Elena took his hand again, locking it in hers. I'm not done holding this hand yet, she said. Regardless of how you feel about her, there is another problem, she began again. Even if you push her out of your life and avoid her, there is the concept of closure. Psychologists like to call this closure. I don't like this term because when it comes to people and emotions, nothing is ever really over. In five or ten years, even when you've resolved everything, there will still be fifty or sixty questions that you simply don't have answers to. But for your own sake, so that you don't spend the rest of your life doubting yourself, you need to talk to her. Damn, I thought. I was worried that Elena wouldn't be as persistent and about my father, who was just as weak. Now, things were moving so fast that I was gone for five minutes, and I didn't know what the hell was going on. Elena talked about the rest of their lives as if it were a foregone conclusion that they would spend it together, and my father didn't argue with her. It was exactly what I wanted, but the sequence of events was not at all what I had planned. I probably shouldn't be upset because all I wanted was for my dad to separate from my cheating mom. I wanted him to find someone who would love him and who would be worthy of his love, and it looks like he will end up with the right woman. After thinking about it, I stopped interfering. Let's let the universe sort it out. Life seems to have a way of working things out in the end. Now you're too nervous and too excited, Elena said. Stop drinking coffee. Actually, I want you to just get out and go somewhere to calm down. Then, come back to me, and we'll wait for her together. You said she'd be in the O for about another hour, right? She will have to stay in intensive care for at least that long, so you have time, but you can't just ignore it. I want you back in an hour. And what about, he began. Melinda and I are here, she said. We can fill out any forms or do whatever needs to be done. I smiled at him as he looked at me. He came over and hugged me tightly. I walked over and sat down next to Elena. Go. Dad, I said. Elena is right. Driving always calms you down. As my father walked toward the door, a woman from across the room reached over and grabbed his sleeve. I'm so sorry for your pain, she said sadly. My father nodded his head. I don't even think he paid attention to what she said to him. Then, I recognized her. It was Russell Eddington's wife. Elena started talking as soon as I sat down. Melinda, I thought you were the main schemer, she said, but your mother beat us all. She outplayed us all. She tricked your father into thinking she was sick so she wasn't at the dance. She told you that if she was there, your father would be too shy to dance with me, right? I nodded, trying to understand what she was getting at. The call your father received when we arrived at the dance was from her, Elena said. I know that. I said I was glad she called because she was the one who got daddy to dance with you. Don't, Helena said. She called him to make sure you and you were at the dance so she could sneak out and hug Russell. Apparently, this time they were going to a motel because last time you found them at your home. She didn't know what time you were going to be home, and she didn't want to risk getting caught again. Apparently, he lost control of the car or was simply not paying attention to the road, and they crashed into a tree. The airbags deployed perfectly, and Russell only had one injury, but it was a major one. Okay, it's probably a minor injury. I can't believe that damn man was going to cheat on him again, I said. Helena, Dad was right. We just don't need her in our lives, a woman said from across the room. I don't understand you, ma'am, I said, but I don't understand your husband either. You are a beautiful woman, and you two have two adorable little girls. You are much more attractive than my mother. Why the hell would he cheat on you with her? Your mother is not the only one, she said, but she will probably be the last. Helena, he never cheated on you, did he? Of course not, Helena answered as if she had been asked the most obvious thing in the world. But he tried, didn't he? asked his wife. Helena nodded her head. The only good thing about him is that he is a good provider. My girls and I need that kind of financial security. My plan was to wait until my girls are old enough to understand the situation and then divorce him. Now this could all be thrown into the air. 
I'm pretty sure your father is going to name Russell in his divorce case. I'm also sure when this happens, your mom will sue him for something, and I'm sure he'll lose his job because of this. I may just have to go ahead and try to get my piece of the pie before it goes completely bust. I'm so sorry this has affected your family, young lady, she said. As she was saying this, a light bulb went on in my head. After some time, my father returned. Dean called his parents and told them he was going home. He hugged me and kissed me quickly and then said goodbye to everyone. My father sat down next to me where Dean was. I stood up and sat on his other side, pushing him next to Helena, who immediately took his hand back. We sat and talked about anything but not about the accident. We talked for a long time. Eventually, I dozed off. When I woke up, the nurse tapped me on the shoulder. I had fallen asleep with my head on my father's shoulder. He was sleeping with his head thrown back and Helena was in the same position as me, only on the other shoulder. She also hugged his arm as if she had no intention of letting him go. I found it strange that I didn't remember my mother ever holding him so tightly. Can you wake up your mother and father and tell them that she is awake but she can only have visitors for a few minutes, and you better move quickly because with the amount of painkillers they gave her, she will soon fall asleep. I woke up my father and Helena, thinking about what the nurse had called them, my mother and father. It really felt right. We took the elevator to the fifth floor. The nurse told us that we could come in one at a time and stay there for about five minutes. My father headed towards the door and Helena grabbed his hand and pulled him back. Jim, don't go in there angry. She just came out of surgery, so she's already in a lot of pain. Now is not the time to just stress over it. Just stop by and say hello. Can you do this for me? He clenched his fists, finally unclenched them, and nodded his head. Helena was amazing. My father entered the room. He was gone for about 15 seconds and immediately returned. I went in. Then, one side of her face was completely covered with a bandage. She had tubes that delivered medicine into one arm, her shoulder was bandaged on the other side, and they placed her in some kind of frame that kept her spine straight and prevented her from rolling over during the night. There was some kind of metal halo attached to her head, which went from top to the bottom and prevented her from opening her mouth. I think she'll need this until her jaw heals. Hi, mommy, I said. How are you feeling? A sound came out of her mouth that was somewhere between a grunt and a squeal. I told you that if you cheat on him again, something bad will happen to you, but you didn't listen. So, you deserve what you got, and what you got is a scam. Mom, since we're the only ones in the room, I'll let you in on a little secret. I was never going to lose sight of this. This was my plan from the very beginning, ever since I first caught you. I've been looking for someone who can take care of dad when I go to college. Helena is perfect for him. I appreciate you helping me put them together. Looks like she can handle it. Her eyes got bigger, and it seemed like she was trying to say something, but the metal circle was preventing her from moving. However, it seemed that even trying to move caused her pain. But you should be grateful to her. If it weren't for her, he wouldn't even come here to see you, I said. She looked at me angrily. Mom, don't be angry with me. It wasn't my fault. I'd like to think about it though. Dad knows about you and Eddington, but I didn't tell him. He found out about it just before the police came for us. Guess what? It wasn't the police either, it was Coach Cleats. The coach was angry with Dad and Helena. He got drunk and told Dad he shouldn't. Dad knocked him out. He hit him on the fifth place in front of the whole school, including the kids on his team. It got me thinking, how exactly could the coach know that you were training Eddington? The coach and the director are not exactly friends. You were a coach too, weren't you, mom? I looked into her eyes, and she couldn't look me in the eyes. I just shook my head. What are you doing, mom? Well, I guess my five minutes are up. I probably won't come to see you very often, so see you. When I went outside, Dad took my hand. Thank you for everything, Helena, he said. I don't think I could have done this without you. I've thought a lot about what you said, and it makes sense, but I'm just not sure I can do it. I'm not sure I can pull this off. Even now, when she is not in the room, I want to strangle her in that Eddington. He took a deep breath to calm himself. 
Anyway, I'm sorry if my problems ruined your evening. Let's go, Keith. Let's go home. Did you bring my car here, Helena? Dad asked. I. I drove her car, remember? She handed you the keys. Do you still have my keys, Melinda? Helena asked. I nodded. Okay, see you at home. My father's mouth dropped, but he had been listening to her all evening, so he just agreed. When we got home, I just went over, changed my clothes, and went to bed. I could hear their conversation even when I fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, I showered and went downstairs to grab something to eat. Dad was sleeping and burring on the sofa. I heard movement in the kitchen. I walked in, and Helena was standing in front of the stove. She had two frying pans working, in one, she was frying bacon, and in another, she was making pancakes. What struck me most was what she was wearing. She was wearing my dad's U of M t-shirt and nothing else. I was sure she was wearing underwear, but I wouldn't bet on it. I borrowed a couple of things from you, she said. I didn't want to wake you. I can't fit into any of your mom's things. This solved the underwear issue. Why didn't you borrow jeans or a skirt? I asked. She raised an eyebrow, and I understood she wanted my father to see her in the things he loved most. We talked all night, she said. He's very upset. The two of us will have to help him get through this, Melinda. Last night, I told him everything about me. I think he's a little upset with me. Why should he be upset with you? I asked. Because I need to be honest with him, she said. I don't want any secrets between us, so I had to let him know that I was at the dance for a reason. I had to go ahead and tell him that I was pretty much stalking him ever since I first met him while hunting for specimens in the forest. I think it made him see me as something like your mother. I think he really believes that I will go after a married man. The only way to let him know that I'm actually not that bad would be to let him know who told me he was probably available, and I couldn't do it without giving you away. If I was not sure that it belonged to my father, then it was this statement that convinced me. She not only belonged to my father, she belonged to us. Don't worry, Helena, I said. We'll all be in order after breakfast. She nodded her head and picked up the fork she was using to flip the bacon and the spatula she was using to cook the pancakes. I took the fork. I'm terrible at making pancakes. After breakfast, Helena borrowed a pair of my sweatpants. Naturally, she chose blue ones, and they matched her dad's sweatshirt, which she refused to give up. She packed lunch, and while dad argued and complained all the way, she took us out of the house for a picnic. We found ourselves back in the forest, in the same place where we hunted for the specimen. The three of us talked the whole time, and I confessed everything. Helena also confessed to my father that she loved him. The saddest part was seeing that dad was still angry but just couldn't handle what my mom did. Several times, he told Helena how beautiful she was and even said, I would be crazy about you if it weren't for. We all knew what he meant. Helena, why isn't Dean here? I asked. She arched her eyebrow again. We watched movies and relaxed for the rest of the day. Dean joined us after leaving church. We sat there, watched movies, talked, laughed, and ate. I noticed that Helena was never more than a few inches away from my father. The next day, we all returned to the real world. I had to turn in assignments and take a test. People looked at me all day. The guys from the team constantly came up to me and shouted or laughed, Pooh, they said. They also delivered mock strikes. I found out what was going on almost before lunch. Nobody knew what really happened at the dance. Not many people heard what Coach Kitts told my father, but everyone saw the results. The strange thing was that no one noticed it until this morning, but Coach Kitts was also in the hospital when he landed on his butt. He broke his tailbone. The assistant coach conducted the training. Towards the end of the day, we were all called into the hall for a meeting. The deputy director explained to us that Principal Eddington had been involved in an accident over the weekend and would be hospitalized in the near future. She told us that we would continue to work as if he was still here because that's what he wanted. She told us to keep praying for him, and I was glad I didn't. One person asked how long he would be gone, and she told us that she didn't know but that he would be back as soon as possible. 
Another person asked about the extent of his injuries. This made me laugh. I came home and looked in the refrigerator. I had already made dinner once or twice, so I decided I would make dinner. I had a lot of time because dad wouldn't be home from work for at least another 90 minutes. I was very surprised when I heard a car drive up. I was even more surprised when I heard someone knock on the door. I opened it and saw Helena. I just stepped aside, and she came in. She went into the kitchen and looked around. What are you doing? She asked. Burgers, I smiled. I'll cook them, and let dad fry them when he gets back from his run. He is running? She asked. I simply nodded. Okay, what are we cooking for the patties? She asked. I shrugged. How about a nice big salad? We'll mix everything we can find, and if you don't like it, just don't put it on the plate. That's a good idea, I said. She pulled out a large bowl, and we chopped up the vegetables, onions, and mushrooms. Do you think you won't mind if I run away with him? She asked. I think you would like it, I said. And she did it. When my father returned home, she was waiting for him in her workout clothes, and I'm sure he noticed how great she looked. They came home, took a shower, and we all had dinner together. During dinner, we talked and avoided the gorilla in the room. Helena mentioned that her car made a strange sound and sometimes lost power. After dinner, Dad went into the garage and got to work. Helena pulled out her reading glasses and began checking her papers in the garage next to him. My grandmother called and asked if she could come. Dad told her that she was always welcome. Once there, Helena went upstairs and took a long bath. My grandmother wanted to know why Dad wasn't in the hospital on Sunday or that day. She looked at me and asked if my father was stopping me from visiting my mother. Apparently, my mother didn't tell my grandmother anything. I know she had an accident, Jim, and she totaled the car, but it's not even your car. Why are you so angry with her? When Dad explained the situation and the details of the incident to my grandmother, she almost lost consciousness. She apologized to my father, and he explained that he made sure she received the best possible care, but he was still too angry and too hurt to go see her. After that, my grandmother left and still looked shocked as she got into her car and drove away. A week later, we all went to the Harvest Festival dance, me with Dean, of course, and Dad with Helena. If I thought she looked impressive at the practice dance, it was nothing compared to the real dance. The biggest difference was how they were treated, everyone just knew they were a couple. Not a single guy came up to ask her to dance. I think there were two reasons for this, firstly, because she didn't let my father go all night, she even held his hand while they ate, and secondly, people were still talking about what happened to the coach. I heard a few guys say, dude, if you ask her to dance, this guy will knock you out. It was a wonderful evening. This allowed Helena to come out of her shell and really show people how friendly, charming, and funny she could be. She didn't have to worry about guys hitting on her all the time when my dad was around. Both her smile and the light in her eyes tripled. Of course, she smiled at him most of the time, but that's how it should be. Even after the dance became history, it simply changed. She no longer had to hide behind lab coats and stupid safety glasses so a lot more guys crashed into the walls. But every night, she waited for my father at home, and sometimes even went to the factory where he worked, as if she couldn't wait for them to be together again. This continued for the next few weeks. Both Dad and Helena told me they would take me to the hospital if I wanted to go. Dad also told me that if I wanted to go alone, I would be more than happy to use Mom's car or the Jeep that Dad drove in the winter. As for Helena, they were almost never apart, they were only away from each other when they were at work and, of course, while they were sleeping. Their romance, if you can call it that, was strictly school level. I don't think I've ever seen them kiss. I knew how Helena felt about my father, but I wasn't sure how he felt about her until one evening he came home and she wasn't there. He didn't ask me anything, so I decided not to tell him. He looked around the house and then looked outside. He still didn't say anything, so I didn't provide any information. However, I secretly videotaped him looking around the entire house and repeatedly looking out the window. When she finally showed up, he pretended everything was fine. Oh, hi, he said and headed into the garage. Helena looked at me strangely. What have I done? She asked. I told her, 
Why didn't you tell him we had a parent-teacher conference today? She asked, because it's time, I said. Time for what? She asked. Elena, dad is stuck in limbo. It's time for him to return to the real world. He doesn't even think about his mother. She's been in the hospital for over a month now, and we haven't visited her once. I'll take you to her if you want, Helena, I said. Damn me, I said. I don't want to see her. Maybe he doesn't want to either, she said. Even as I watched the expression on her face when she said that, I knew her fur was standing on end and she was ready to fight for my father. Calm down, Helena, but we both know that he needs to start some kind of divorce proceedings or something like that. He can't just forget about her and hope she goes away. She texts me daily, and I'm sure she texts him as well. As soon as she can talk, she will probably start calling, and then there are you too, I said. What's wrong with us? She asked, her cheeks flushed and she blushed even as she said it. Elena, he really loves you very much, I said. You know it. Well, I more than just love him, she said. That's it, I said. But he's afraid to admit that he feels the same way about you. How do we know he really feels that way, she asked. I showed her the video I had just taken of him wandering around the house, looking into every room, and constantly looking out the window. What was he looking for? She smiled. You, Helena. I smiled. He doesn't admit it, but he really missed you. So, it's time for him to stop pretending and move on with his life. Hold that thought, she said. Indeed, the time has come. I watched as she walked through the kitchen and out into the garage. My father was leaning over his car, doing something. I don't know what he does with this car all the time. I think he's talking to her, but she tapped him on the shoulder, and he straightened up. She wrapped her arms around him and pulled his face to hers and kissed him. At first, he just stood there, but then his arms wrapped around her, and he kissed her back. Watching them made me wish I wasn't such a good girl and that Dean and I didn't take the vow of chastity. This sight made my legs give way. Principal Eddington returned to school the next day, and the coach returned the next week. The coach walked bent over and very slowly. Eddington never left his office, he had a new secretary, it was his wife. She smiled at me every time I passed her in the hallways. She asked about her mother, and I had to say that I had not seen her. She asked me how my father was doing, and I think she cared. After all, she had been through what he had gone through, so she knew how much it hurt. I think that we're all waiting to see what my father was going to do, and his plan of action. Eddington knew that if my father mentioned him in the divorce, his career would be over. My mom will probably try to sue him, whether successful or not, but the mere mention of what happened between them will further damage his career. Coach Kitts was afraid of me and stayed as far away from Helena as possible. He acted as if my father would come out from behind a tree and hit him again. He wrote Helena a letter apologizing to her for his behavior and promising to leave her alone. I think the biggest problem for him was that he was always considered the tough guy at school and many of his players still laughed at him behind his back. Helena and my father were also on standby, she practically lived with us, but they did not sleep together. They might as well have done it because there were so many nights when I got up for a drink and found them sleeping together on the couch, still fully clothed but huddled together as if their lives depended on it. Finally, the tension is over. Without hesitation, I picked up the phone and heard my mother's voice. Hey, Melinda, is your dad available? When my shock wore off, I handed him the phone. When he answered the call, his back straightened and his whole demeanor changed. He said a few words and hung up. He said a few words and hung up. Helena grabbed his hand and he smiled nervously. I don't think there's any point in putting it off any longer. Let the battle begin, he said. The next day, he went to see her, from what he told me later and from what I learned from my grandmother. When he entered the room, she was sitting upright in her bed. She had lost some weight and put on makeup to reduce the effects of bruises. She continued to be as aggressive as usual but found that it no longer worked. James, I'm sad that you still haven't been able to come see me once, she said. How can we fix our marriage if we don't talk? I understand that I made a huge mistake and it will take us a long time to overcome this. In fact, I don't think we can handle this alone. I have a therapist in the hospital, she does family therapy. 
I think next time you come, maybe you should bring Melinda, and we should have a session with her. My father didn't say a word. He simply placed a stack of papers on her bed next to her. She looked at the papers and cried. No, she said. We don't do that. We need to talk about this. Okay, let's talk, he said. Talk to me about why you did this to us. Tell me about how our daughter found you and that idiot in our bed, in our house. Tell me about how an 18-year-old girl had to try to save her father because his heart was broken and then had to put all the pieces back together. Tell me about how I found out anyway. Tell me about how that idiot coach found out what you were doing to Eddington. Tell me about how Melinda caught you and you swore you would have stopped but started with him again. Come on, speak. I'm sorry, she whined. We have to get through this. I'll never do this again, I swear. You said the same thing to Melinda, he said. There's probably nothing more to talk about. Get yourself a lawyer, Teresa. The next day, my mother was served with official divorce papers in her hospital room. According to my grandmother, who was there, a woman who looked like a student entered the room chewing gum and carrying a folder. Teresa Carson, she asked. My mother expected this and simply extended her hand. This started the battle. Over the next few weeks, they fought, they exchanged accusations. My mother refused to agree to the divorce and even made counter-accusations. She claimed that dad moved his mistress into the house, which was technically true. Elena felt terrible about this. The day after the allegations surfaced, she returned to her apartment for the first time in months. My father went and brought her back home. He told her that her place was with us and nowhere else. The fight continued for weeks. Finally, I couldn't stand it. I asked Dad when his next meeting with Mom and her lawyers was. He told me the next day. I went and saw my mother that evening. I explained to her that she had lost Dad. There was simply no chance that he would ever take her back. The best she could do was at least remain polite. Things went back and forth so much that Dad withdrew his original proposal for an agreement. Now, he didn't offer her anything. He just wanted to say, you get out of my house. Dad wanted the house, full custody of me, and not to have mom bother him anymore. He refused to pay her for ruining his life. He also planned to sue Eddington for everything he could. I invited Mr. Eddington and his wife to a meeting. I sat at a long table with Dad and Elena at one end, mom and her lawyers on the other side, and Mr. Eddington and his wife on one side. I presented them with my plan. My plan calls for Mr. Eddington to pay my mother child support for four years and rehire her as his secretary. That way, mom could go back to college and learn some skills so that when child support runs out, she can support herself. Dad gets the house, mom keeps her car, and she rents Elena's apartment. In exchange, dad agrees not to sue or mention Mr. Eddington in the divorce suit, and mom doesn't try to make her fake intimate assault case. I could agree with that, Eddington said. His wife looked relieved. She smiled at me and told me that I would be a great lawyer someday. It's a good deal for the Eddingtons. Paying my mom child support for four years would be expensive but not as expensive as any of the lawsuits my parents could file. He was also able to keep his job. Neither my father nor my mother looked convinced. It just doesn't feel right, my father said. It turns out that they destroyed my life and my family for free. Teresa simply leaves without facing any problems and without punishment, and he just goes away and saves his career. I won't agree to this at all, my mother said. I'm not going to give up on my family. I admit that I was wrong, but I was forced. Eddington was the boss, he was a man with power. I had no choice. If I hadn't made a deal with him, I might have lost my job. It's too late for me to start over. I want my life and my family back. Shut up, Mom, I said sharply. You need to accept this agreement so we can all move on. Mr. Eddington may have been your boss, but you forget that I caught you. And if I testify about what I heard and saw, your case will fail. You also forget that at the time of the accident, you were no longer working for Mr. Eddington, so there could have been no coercion. There are two more things you need to consider. First, just one word from me is all it takes for Dad to drop you from his health insurance. Without this, you will never find the money to fix your face. You'll have to spend the rest of your life looking like a Picasso painting. 
And finally, Mom, you didn't just give up on your family, you threw it away. We just weren't as important to you as what you did with Mr. Eddington, so you don't deserve us. If you go too far, there may not even be an opportunity for redemption in the future. Make the right choice, Mom. Stop some of Dad's pain, let him go. I turned to my dad. You're right, of course. You are the one who suffered here. I see that. So, I'll just tell you two things because while you were right in your argument, you need to look beyond that. Both Mom and Mr. Eddington really pay for what they did. Maybe it's not enough, but they pay. Mr. Eddington has lost an important part of his anatomy. Apparently, it won't be easy for him. The reimplantation surgery was unsuccessful, and they are going to try to create a new one for him. So that's one of the ways he pays. He'll also pay mom child support, so you don't have to. Isn't that enough to make him suffer, or should his family pay too? Dad, they are victims too. If you ruin his career, you will also ruin the lives of two innocent children who did not harm you. It won't be easy for him anyway, even if you do this, his wife hates him. She will make his life hell, and he will have to work with his mother every day while she blames him for losing us. It won't be easy either, mom suffers too, dad. She loses the man she claims to love and her daughter too. She loses her home and most of her friends. Even the job Mr. Eddington offers her is temporary, she will have to gather her strength and start her life over. Life is not so easy for older single women. My mom started crying, and I continued, and if you look at it, dad, it will be better for you in two ways. You're getting rid of a woman you could never trust again. You get rid of a woman who cheated on you more than once. You can move on with your life and never see her again. We both can. In return, you get the sweetest, most beautiful, most wonderful woman I know to share your life with. My father smiled and hugged Elena. Why are you hugging her? I was talking about myself, I quipped. Very funny, Keith said. Elena nodded her head. Okay, I agree, he said. I looked at my mother. She nodded her head, then lowered it and began to cry again. The lawyers agreed to formalize everything. As I said, the idea of forcing one of the cheaters to pay alimony to the other was unusual, but both parties were confident that they could arrange it. If the judge doesn't agree with it as written, Mr. Eddington will simply send child support to Dad, who will then give it to Mom. Three days later, they met again to sign documents. My mother brought my grandmother with her. My father was with Elena and me, and Mr. Eddington was alone. After signing the documents, my mother reached out to my father with tears in her eyes. She asked him for one last kiss, and Elena said no. Probably a week later, Elena came to me for help. She gave me money and the keys to her car and asked me to take Becky and Dean to the movies. I'm probably not the wittiest person because I didn't understand at first. Then she suddenly realized that she wanted to spend time alone with my father. I laughed and looked at her. You don't have to send me away, I said. Is this something special? Have you already started experimenting? What do you usually do? We haven't actually. Oh my god, I said. I'm leaving. I didn't know you two weren't. It must have gone very well because the next morning they were both grinning from ear to ear. A few months later, here we are at church. I stand here filling the role of both bridesmaid and bridesmaid. Hell, why not? Since I was the one who introduced them and brought them closer together. The problem is that my mom just won't shut up. I'm not sure why they invited her, maybe they wanted to rub her nose in it or maybe she just barged into the wedding. But we had to have this wedding this week. I'm leaving for college next week and I'm not sure how long Elena will be able to fit into her wedding dress. The doctor says she may be pregnant with twins. A few minutes later, the priest asked a question at the end of the wedding vows. Does anyone here know of any reason why this man and woman should not be engaged? I approached my mother when she was about to speak. I leaned over and whispered in her ear, Mom, if you open your mouth, I will slap you right here in this church. Well, this is the part where I have to say, and they lived happily ever after. What do you think of our second part of the story today? I think that the first story was shorter, but still more interesting than the one we're listening to now. What's your impression? Let me know in the comments. See you in the comments.